bunch of different things and talk about a, a number of concepts. Um, and first, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Justy Jaitla. I'm a technical evangelist uh, with Couchbase. Um, and uh, this is my contact info. I love shout outs on Twitter. Um, if you feel, feel free to, to ping me on Twitter anytime. Um, this is my contact info. I'll display it again at the end. Um, if you guys have any questions after the presentation or in the future when you're using Couchbase, you can feel free to ping me uh, at any time and I'd love to give you uh, some help. So I like to always start with kind of where I came from and why I found Couchbase. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was working in a startup bootstrapping it. Um, and whenever you bootstrap a startup, you uh, feel very pressed for time. And we, at the time, I was a product manager. Um, and we had this application we had built in PHP, you know, MySQL. And even at, as it stood at that time, without even a number of users, it just wasn't cutting it in terms of performance. We were trying to do a lot of real-time interaction. And so I uh, rolled up my sleeves and rebuilt the whole app um, using Ruby Rails, PubNub, Catchbase, and Neo4j. I discovered Catchbase you know, through some blog posts, and it was really obscure for me. Um, but during that time, I learned quite a bit about Catchbase, and I became really excited about it and started using it and evangelizing it on my own. And when we didn't get funding, I left um, the startup and uh, started working for Catchbase. And that's kind of how I came into the NoSQL world. Um, most of my life I had done uh, relational development um, in various languages from .NET to Java to uh, mostly Java and .NET um, in the early years. And then I moved to Ruby on Rails and um, Couchbase. So one of the things that I discovered in those early days of Couchbase were the core principles of Couchbase, um, which were true then and are still true today. Um, the easy scalability, being able to you know, scale up your cluster really easily, um, especially for DevOps type people. This is like a huge benefit of Couchbase. Um, the consistent high performance, the sub millisecond read and write response times I was throwing data at Couchbase like crazy, and uh, it didn't skip a beat. And I was really excited about how fast I could, um, you know, the kind of performance I was getting. Um, the rolling upgrades um, and the no downtime for, you know, schema change or hardware changes is really awesome. And then what really was super exciting to me was the JSON document model, uh, that flexible schema just makes development so much more fun and easy, um, more agile. And that's kind of how I came to Couchbase, and that's what it was like then and it still is now, um, with even more features in Couchbase 2.0, which came out in 12.12.12 uh, uh, in December of last year. So I like to actually kind of talk about where, where I progressed in sort of application development. Um, and I like to go, uh, use metaphors to kind of describe that, how I came to understand Couchbase um, in terms of the sort of mental framework that you enter when you get into NoSQL from relational. It's really a paradigm shift, and it's really different. And uh, it, it takes a little bit getting used to. And I, The people who are attending this are either people that are experienced with NoSQL or they're very new to NoSQL. And that first sort of uh, you know time of developing your first application can be mind-boggling for people coming from relational because it's simpler. So applications have many dimensions. Um, you know, there's the data organization side and the creative side. Um, there's the presentation layer and then the business object layer. And I liked this diagram because it really kind of describes that you know applications have more than one dimension to it. Um, it's everything put together, aesthetic and, you know, functional together. Um, and uh, I think that, um, you know, relational systems, you know, tend to lean towards the left 
side of this image, and I feel like Couchbase kind of incorporates a bit of both, uh, which is exciting. Um, and you'll you'll hopefully know the answer to that question um, by the end of this presentation. So we tend to think of our developer brain as something like this: this you know machines or gears or organization, um, and that's actually called the modernist mind from the late 19th and early 20th centuries of these sort of fixed structures with our minds. But in reality, the real developer brain is something like this. And, um, you know, there's a lot of influences, there's a lot of things going in, and we're organizing it, we're pulling data from all different kinds of places. And our relationships and our modeling actually tends to look more like this. And this is sort of the postmodern mind of uh, you know sort of a graph relationships of, of, of data and properties and methods objects um, you know and this is a little bit more accurate of sort of how it all fits together in a much more complex way I guess this is also the post postmodern mind uh, sorry <laughs> I had to put that in there is uh, whether we're in the postmodern world or the post-postmodern world is one of those sort of philo philosophical debates. So this makes sense to us. You know, users do these things, and we call those methods in sort of object-oriented uh, languages. Users have properties or state, and we usually represent that with instance variables. So we understand these things. These make sense. When we're whiteboarding our application, this also makes sense. You know, users are doing this, and then they have that. Um, and it really fits into sort of this relationship mind uh, that we have. And so when we're creating models, this is very organic. It's very easy to whiteboard what your application should do. It usually starts simple and it gets more and more complex over time. Um, in relational model modeling, though, this is where things get a little bit inorganic. So in memory, you have, you know, data structures um, you know, the instance variables and the methods, right? So the instance variables take the form of sort of keys and values. In relational databases, um, the variable, instance variables tend to be columns in a table. They tend to map one to one uh, for the simple data structures. So like if you have an instance variable, you know, for the full name, you know, it'll be represented by, a, you know, a string uh, and then in uh, your relational table be represented by a var card. So for our simple, um, you know, instance variables, this is actually, you know, much like an Excel spreadsheet, very linear and very understandable. Where things get really complicated is when you start having complex in-memory um, data structures. When you have arrays or dictionaries or hashes, you know, when you have collections of objects, and each of those objects have simple and complex values. That's when things in relational systems get much more complicated. Um, relational databases can't map complex collections simply, meaning you have to break them out through normalization into multiple tables to represent the collections. And that starts creating, you know, what I call the table sprawl. As applications get much more complex, you know, the joins to, to aggregate or denormalize that data gets slower and slower at scale. It also makes it very difficult to understand the application. Once you have 500, 600 tables, um, it being a new developer and trying to uh, ramp up and actually understand that model or even remember the model if you've been working on an application is actually quite difficult and be, can be really complex and can take, be very time consuming. Um, so as applications grow more complex, you become less and less agile. In the traditional world or the old, old world of, of application development, a lot of this stuff was handled by DBAs. And DBAs are far less common than they used to be. Um, an organization back in the day without a DBA was unheard of. Um, but nowadays, uh, DBAs are, you know, far less common. And so developers have sort of more control over applications um, and the data structures. 
And a lot of that application logic and inherent schemas are actually in your business object layer, you know, in your object model. Martin Fowler is a great author who wrote a book called NoSQL Distilled, and he talked about this aggregate view of data. So on the left side, you see a sort of web form uh, or displaying, you know, a customer order. And while the details are not super important, well, the the uh, of the actual, you know, web form, what he's des describing here is that this is an aggregate view of data. That means it's a denormalized view of data. The data that makes up that web form comes from multiple tables and joins pulled together and aggregated together into a single point of view. In relational systems, you know, it's much more complex because you have to actually pull from many tables and do joins across those tables, which requires comp computation time on the server. In uh, a document store like Couchbase, it's quite different because you actually store the um, aggregate data uh, in a document. So there is no computation required to gather all these different pieces together, join them together, and return it to your app server. In this case, you can see sort of an example of a one-to-one -one mapping of that um, web form to the data structure. You notice in the data structure, we're representing complex um, in-memory data structure as well. So you see the line items there is an array of dictionaries or hashes. Um, the payment is actually a hash. So these sort of more complex structures are really natural to JSON, um, and it maps uh, directly to your in-memory object model. Martin Fowler actually called this this mismatch of, of database data structure and in-memory uh, data structure. The mismatch is called an impedance um, impedance mismatch, meaning the data structures don't match uh, in terms of structure between in-memory and object model and in-database. Um, so document stores have this sort of remove the impedance mismatch. Uh, so they map uh, directly, and you can describe complex data structures that are in-memory in your data as well. So JSON supports a direct relationship of in-memory data structures to data storage. And that's an important thing to understand if you're new to um, using JSON or you new to using documents to represent objects. So the typical workflow is you have an object in instance variables. You represent it as JSON by serializing it. You store it in Couchbase. You pull it back from Couchbase as JSON, and then you deserialize um, into your object. And this is a typical workflow um, with working with Couchbase. You know, in different languages, it's, it's done slightly differently. Um, you know, in uh, .NET and Java, you actually pick your transcoder for um, serializing and deserializing from JSON. In Ruby, it's 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 kind of included. In Node.js, JSON is a first class object, so you don't actually have to do any serialization or deserialization. So our document structure in Couchbase has two parts. The first part is the meta information. That includes the key um, of the document, and then the document itself, which is the actual JSON. Uh, so Couchbase is still structured like a key value store, much like a hash or dictionary in your programming language of choice. Um, or even an instance variable and its value. You know, you have a key and a value. Couchbase works the same way, and that key is that meta ID, and the document is the actual JSON value, and typically it's that's your object instance variables. I like to talk about the uh, like the best products because where Couchbase kind of comes from is uh, is really interesting, uh, the the sort of core principles. So I like to think of the best products don't just solve a need, even though we are told that a lot, you know, you need to solve a need. But I think what's even better is the best products create and solve a need. Um, this is Keynesian economics, and that's a, the Say's law, supply creates its own demand. And I feel like many uh, companies, you know, the innovative companies, probably the most innovative companies, embrace that. Um, Apple is certainly one of them. 
Uh, Google is certainly one of them. You know, particularly the Google Glass is going to be, you know, something that creates a need and solves a need. Even Facebook creates and solves needs. Um, now you, there's a, a need for Facebook, um, and it's created by Facebook. And I think this is interesting because what happens when you do both really well? And when you do both really well, you scale. And it usually results in an acquisition and IPO. And scale is a very important consideration um, when creating an application. And I think that that's kind of leads you into why Couchbase. And let's go through a, a, a little bit of history of Couchbase and why. Um, and this happened uh, last year. The Draw Something app is really kind of an interesting growth curve. Within a few weeks of uh, you know their application, they launched their application um, for for about a few weeks. Uh, there wasn't very much traffic, um, and then they got a tweet on. I think it was March first or so from someone on Jersey Shore about how awesome their app was, and then I think about a week later they got a tweet from Miley Cyrus about how how much she loves the app, and within three weeks. They went from a few thousand daily active users to 16 million daily active users. So they were on Couchbase, and they were able to scale their application um, in, in record time. It was one of the fastest growing apps ever. Um, and the, the data was actually nonlinear. That's what you can see by the solid gray uh, arrow there, is that was the, the growth of data. And they had zero downtime in that time. So they you know, had 30 million downloads in three weeks, 16 million daily active users, um, three terabytes of data, and no downtime. It's pretty exciting for us um, to talk about it. We talk about scale a lot, but it's, it was exciting to have like such a um, you know, poignant, powerful example uh, with the Draw Something app. Going through a little bit of history of where Couchbase comes from, you know, in 1995, this is pretty much in what a, a web application was like. And back then, if, uh, if you guys were old enough, if you were able to make a dynamic website, you could easily double your salary, where you actually change data on the web page, um, any data, uh, even adding a counter. Um, in the late 90s, you know, applications started growing, hard drives started becoming cheaper, um, more people were started connecting to the internet, more businesses were using the internet um, for their web presence, although it was still very young. Um, and as the traffic grew, they were able to scale up by adding maybe another app server and still pointing to their own uh, their SQL database server. Back then, S SQL database was the only database of choice. There was no other choices, um, and so everyone was basically you know using this paradigm in the late 90s. By the early 2000s, people uh, were increasingly on the internet, um, at both at work and at home. And with long-running queries, the idea of caching the results of those queries um, became, you know, very commonplace. Um, the SQL database server itself was scaled vertically. You added more app servers, and this is kind of what things look like. And it was quite difficult even then to sustain the loads. The idea of virality was still also very young, um, and nothing really went viral like it goes viral today. By the mid-2000s, you had this situation where you now have mobile devices packed in with, you know, web browsers. Um, the, you know, the beginning of the smartphone movement, and you know, your vertically scaled single couch um, sorry, single SQL server could not handle the traffic. And so you started out with, um, you know, doing replication for reads, but you still have a right bottleneck with your master node. Um, and then eventually you start sharding. And sharding data means taking portions of your data and putting it on different servers and using some sort of mechanism on the server side to decide which server to go to whenever retrieving data. At the end of this process, if you still had to keep on scaling and you weren't able to, to handle the the, this, the um, traffic at, at that load with these schemes, which many people could not, uh, you ended up removing joins. The most expensive part of your relational system is joins, especially when your joins are very complicated and large. Um, 
And once you remove joins from a relational database, you become a NoSQL database. So the idea of actually starting <coughs> with a NoSQL database it was interesting and, and emerged uh, sort of in this sort of mid 2000s as an idea, you know, to actually have denormalized data. And it came from what happens when you try and scale SQL Server to the max. Couchbase simplifies this. So uh, now you've got a caching layer and a database in one, and it's able to scale linearly instead of you can scale both horizontally and vertically. Uh, so Couchbase simplifies this. Um, and I think that this is one of the attractive features of Cashbase for developers and DevOps people is that you've got kind of both in one. It's super high performance. All the client SDKs um, make direct connections to the Couchbase cluster. When they make a connection, they receive a topology of the actual cluster and then go directly to the nodes that are responsible for that key and value. This makes it very performant. And when you add new nodes to the cluster, all the client SDKs um, work this way. They get a topology update, and they go directly to the new server. I think this is important to understand because we, we don't have sort of a master-slave type um, architecture. What we have is a distributed architecture, which allows the clients to go directly to the nodes responsible for the key and value that they are either trying to um, create, read, or update, or delete. It goes directly to the node responsible for that, and that reduces latencies considerably. This is why Couchbase is so fast. We have a number of webinars, actually, that go into the architecture. If you're interested in learning more about the architecture, I suggest you know watching some of the previous webinars where we talk about um, some of those features. So we have official SDKs in all the popular languages, they all are uh, work the same way in terms of uh, maintaining the topology of Couchbase server and uh, connecting directly to Couchbase. And now I'm going to take a, a minute to uh, answer some questions, and um, then I'm going to talk about the app that uh, um, that we are. Uh, that I'm going to demo that I've been building for the last uh, couple weeks. So we've got a question about um, can you use Catchbase just for caching? Well, yes, actually one of the sort of um, upgrade paths from migrating an application from a relational database to Couchbase is actually replacing the memcached tier with Couchbase. And we are backwards compatible with memcached APIs. And so you start with moving Couchbase um, into the caching layer and then slowly migrate it to it being your primary data store. And this is actually quite common. Um, um, which language is recommended for starting developing web apps with Couchbase? Well, you, you should probably use the language that you're um, you know, familiar with. Um, I personally had learned Ruby and Couchbase at the same time, which was kind of exciting to do both at the same time. Um, I didn't have to spend as much time learning about integrating Rails with um, SQL databases um, because I jumped straight into Couchbase so that I didn't have to do as much unlearning uh, as I would have had to have done with, say, .NET or uh, Java. Um, Um, this is a good question. Is there a way to migrate uh, SQL schema data to NoSQL? I think first understanding um, how NoSQL works, understanding aggregates. Um, and well, like I said before, one of the upgrade paths is to replace your memcached tier with Couchbase, and you know use it as a caching layer and slowly you know migrate different data into Couchbase that you're pulling from SQL Server and mix the two together until you can replace it entirely. Or you can do a big migration where you take your you know, data. In the first step, you could take all the tables and turn them into documents, but that doesn't necessarily work um, directly because of all those relationships. It's actually its own topic um, that's, uh, you know, 
uh, probably uh, we have some blog posts about how you uh, and some previous webinars about how to migrate from RDBMS to uh, NoSQL. So I'm going to now talk about um, Repo Wall. So Repo Wall is an app that I have been building over the last couple weeks. Um, and um, let's go ahead and switch over to a demo. So I had, um, this is me on uh, GitHub. I had been um, sort of looking at GitHub and think, trying to think of a good app um, to develop that used a lot of different sort of technologies. And one of the things that I noticed about GitHub was, you know, I have all these, um, you know, repos here. And when you're browsing, browsing other people, you know, after I think it's about the 20th, repo, um, it drops all the descriptions of, um, of the repo, which makes it much harder actually to know what these repositories are. Um, and these might actually be perfectly valid, they just haven't been updated in a while, but they might still be really interesting, um, you know, repositories. And I thought, hey, here's a great opportunity to um, learn more about users um, and create an app with Couchbase. And so I developed uh, Repo Wall, and Repo Wall is up. Um, I'm still actually adding quite a bit of stuff to it, but there's enough here to kind of get excited about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and reload this page, and kind of talk about you know where I where I started and how I got started with Repo Wall. One of the first things that I did actually um, to get started, because I'm using JSON in Couchbase is just pull JSON off of um, off of GitHub and put it straight into Couchbase. So I, you know, used the GitHub API, pulled my user info and my repos, and dumped them straight into Couchbase as JSON. Um, and this allowed me to kind of build sort of some of these concepts here, you know, really quickly. I was able to do that within a few hours you know, have a shell of an app, you know, you know, rearing to go, and then I can add more things to it. Um, so in this, what I'm doing here is basically, you know, pulling the GitHub repos and stats um, off of off of GitHub and the user information, and then I'm also um, taking that and using some of this information to do sort of dynamic sorting. So this was like the least um, least recently updated. Uh, repo. It, this one, you, know, you can see this fork icon for all the forks. Um, if you look at my user, it looks like I have, you know, predominantly Ruby. So I kind of want to see, you know, for this user, you know, looks like, you know, these are just all the R Ruby uh, repos. And if I just want to see Java repos, you know, I can just click and it filters automatically. Um, so with the Ruby repos, I can kind of see what is the most recently updated ones? Um, you know, I can also see sort of the popularity. You know, this one has you know three forks and one star. Um, so if I go to Dustin, he's one of our founders here. In his case, you know, what you can see is um, you know he he does a lot of Go and a lot of Python. You know, but predominantly Go. And um, I think this is sort of useful information when you, you can kind of see what people are into just by looking at their repos, you know. And his um, sort of oldest repo is from five years ago. He made a Java memcached client that's actually really popular, um, and the spy memcached client. And you can see how many forks and stars he's gotten, you know, off that one repo. It's, and then, uh, you know, here's another sort of person. Load that person. And um, now it's reloading. Whoops. Okay, and this person seems to be super heavy in, uh, into Ruby. And um, when we look at the popularity, it seems probably like he's probably a core contributor here. Forks and stars in uh, in uh, his repos, and at the very bottom here, I hope you guys can see, I'm actually loading a lot of this stuff in a distributed way across um, uh, using Iron.io and using a message queue and workers 
and you can actually see this in real time because I'm also integrating a the PubNub message library. So this is a complex application. I actually have many moving parts here, um, which I think is kind of exciting. You know, to to put together. You know, I've got this worker queue in the background. You know, pulling stuff because pulling information off these uh, repos when I want to go into detail can be slow, and so I don't want to actually do it in um, in my web app because it'll slow down my web app. So instead, what I do is I create these sort of background tasks. Um, if you want to see your own sort of repo well, just just replace this with your GitHub username. I don't have a search in here yet. But if you replace, you know, repowall.com slash and your GitHub username, it'll be able to load it up. And if you pull up something, uh, your own repos, it'll um, it'll show the progress of the background workers at the bottom for everyone. This is actually broadcast across all all the um, people browsing um, repo wall, so you can kind of see what's going on with workers. There, someone started, uh, you know, pulling up their repos there. You can see in real time all the different workers, and it's sort of cruising through that. So, Repo Wall was an interesting sort of example for me to, you know, have distributed um, workers. To those workers actually interact with Couchbase. Um, they deregister themselves with Couchbase when they're done. So here you have these workers that are created uh, in real time, and um, I have like sort of this, you know, also real-time interface for viewing kind of the information coming off, um, you know, off of my remote workers using iron.io. In this case, you can kind of see, you know, that, hey, the worker was finished, and there was nothing left in the queue, so it killed, you know, killed itself off and actually told Couchbase that it's, it's done as well. So my web app actually controls the remote workers, um, which is kind of interesting, because I might have a lot of idle time in my um, in my app, and so I don't necessarily want to, um, you know, have these workers running all the time. Um, if people aren't browsing the app, I want those workers to kind of die off. So I'm not because um, it, it's cheaper uh, to do it that way instead of just polling um, every second indefinitely. Instead, I have my web app actually control the creation of workers, and the workers themselves handle, um, you know, sort of the seppuku when there's nothing left in the message queue, and they've been idle for about, I think it's about 30 some seconds. They'll, um, you know, kill themselves off and tell Couchbase um, um, to uh, that they're no longer um, in the worker queue. So uh, let's go back to sort of the presentation, and and I can actually show um, some of the documents. First, I'll do it in sort of Keynote here, and sort of talk about um, these documents. So basically, for a user, I have I have four documents: <laughs> the primary user document, which I key based on their GitHub ID. So the key of the document is user colon colon and their GitHub ID. It's a numerical ID I get from GitHub. Um, the, I have a reference document that actually the only value in the document, it's actually just an integer. It's not a JSON document. I take the username and I point it to the GitHub ID. So basically I'm just saying that the, the value of the U colon colon scalable is 1718606. So when I want to retrieve a user by username, um, I pull up their their um, reference document. There is an ID there, and then I pull their primary user document based on that ID. So I have two ways of getting a user profile by name and by GitHub ID. And then I have a repo list document that lists all the repos uh, and a lot of the primary information. On, off of the uh, repo wall there, so a lot of this primary information is um, in that repo list. And then I also save the raw JSON. Uh, I might I might want it later, so uh, I'm keeping that sort of JSON um, for the what I, what I get back from GitHub. That full JSON document I get 
back from GitHub. And that's just keyed off of, you know, it's R colon colon the GitHub ID and then colon colon GitHub is the raw JSON. So a user document here is pretty straightforward actually. Um, you know, I have a I created an idea of a doc type. I have the last time it was retrieved, I whether they're registered or not. So anytime you browse a user, if they don't sign in, like if if you don't sign in, you're you're not registered. But if you browse your own repos, it creates a user document for you, but is registered is just false. Um, whether the user is a super user or not, um, I'm not actually using that right now, but I might have some administration in the future. Um, the last time I've retrieved repos from that user, um, the GitHub ID, the username, the number of followers and following, the GitHub URL, the picture URL, the Gravatar ID that you know where you get the picture from, the number of repos, the number of private repos, and now I can only get that information, the number of private repos, if the user signs in. Um, the user type from GitHub, um, it can be you know it can be an organization or it can be a user, you know the email address, um, and then a, a couple other things, the bio and proficiencies are some concepts that I'm you know kind of thinking about how to expand repo well. Then I have their access token and their personal PubNub channel. So I have like a, a sort of multicast messaging system via PubNub. And like if I want to subscribe to this personal channel for this user, I can do that by using that PubNub channel. Right now I'm not actually using it. I'm only using a global one for all browsers and all users. But I might want to refine that later and actually have a per user sort of status um, status bar at the bottom. So you know a repo list is also pretty simple. Um, I have a doc type called repos and then the GitHub ID and username. Um, I have a language distribution which has the language um, it's it's a dictionary there and I have you know a key that is the language a lowercase and then I have a value which is an array um, that value, um, the first value is sort of the, the, the language, and then the second value is the count of the number of repos with that language. And then, then I have this repos hash um, that has one repo at a, time, at a time with their repo ID, and it has the full, you know, sort of stuff that I get from GitHub. You know, when it was created, um, whether it's a fork or not, how many times it's been forked, or how many people are watching it you know that sort of thing so I have this sort of dictionary of all the repos and for my user class um, I have all these so this fatter basically is just creating getters and setters for these instance variables you don't really have to read them all but what you can kind of see here is that you know I have a bunch of instance variables and then at the bottom you can see that whenever I save the user all I'm doing is replacing the document, and I call this in Ruby is just self to hash. So I'm basically taking all these instance variables and converting it into a hash, and saving it as a JSON document in Couchbase. The Ruby SDK automatically converts hashes to JSON and JSON back to hashes, um, because JSON is a, actually a dictionary or a hash itself. So that results in that user document. So these are all the same uh, instance variables. Um, for my user class, as you see here, um, listed here. So I also run two sites. Um, before I joined Couchbase, I was you know, sharing a lot of my learning and progress of learning NoSQL, and I was doing it with Ruby and Rails. So I started these um, sort of two sites, and I, you know, when I get time, I add more materials to it. Couchbase models is particularly useful for learning these key value patterns. And just for getting started with Couchbase on Rails, Couchbase on Rails just kind of helps you kind of get set up and started with that. Um, and um, if there's any more, if any questions, um, I wanted to make sure I left enough time for people to ask questions. And um, if you tweet, you know, I, I love shout outs and it's a great way to uh, get connected. So let's look at some of the questions um, people have asked. So what type of data schema is not suitable or amenable to Couchbase? So uh, that's a 
really challenging question. I, I, it, it's not that a, there's a, a schema is too complex for Couchbase. I think that um, you know it's more of um, how what you want to do with the data may make you decide to go one way or another. If you're doing business intelligence and analytics on data um, that's not actually live, uh, meaning you have this database, maybe it's a daily dump of data that you're running these uh, long-running queries on and trying to discover um, insights. In that case, you know, a relational database is great. Because, you know, a lot of these BI suites, you know, are geared towards and designed for relational databases. You know, time is not of the essence um, usually in these situations. Um, if you have hum huge amounts of data and very complex map reduces, again, if it's not a real-time application, Hadoop is a great example. So if you're analyzing 100,000 people's worth of genetic data and trying to look for um, gene sequence patterns in it, and it's okay if it takes two days, Hadoop is perfect um, for that type of situation. So it's, it's tricky to answer this question in, you know, in a you know absolute way because it's you know sort of there's a lot of variation here. Um, um, so in relational systems, you have the idea of um, the question is, does Couchbase have any structure to map one to many relationships? Can you add or remove to a list? Well, in Couchbase and and document stores, you don't have joins, but you can have references to other documents. So if I had say a um, a shopping cart, and that the shopping cart document had a list of products um, that are in the shopping cart. Each of those products will have a product ID, and that product ID likely will be its own um, a key for a product document. Um, so I'm just listing sort of the product IDs in my shopping cart, and then I do a multi-get on all those um, keys for all the products in the shopping cart and get a bunch of product documents. So you can you know, move or traverse through your data. You're just not creating joins. It's not a foreign key relationship. You have these sort of independent aggregates, you know, all these documents, and you can have referential IDs between them. And the way you traverse them is through multiple gets. In SQL and relational systems, you tend to want to avoid hitting the database as much as possible. You inherently know that it's going to be taxing to do, you know, tons of queries. So you try and get all your data at once. Um, and you try and cache the results of that data because you know it takes time to compute um, all those joins. In cache space, you have sub millisecond latency. There's no compu <laughs> excuse me, no computation time to retrieve data um, because there are no joins. You know, so you're just pulling documents, and with the sub millisecond latencies, it's very common to have multiple gets in a row. Um, let's see another question here. Uh, if the app SDKs are containing info about the cluster, um, I guess using the REST, REST API is a no-no. In Couchbase, we actually re uh, don't have a REST API. What we recommend in terms of how we set up our latencies between our SDK and the Couchbase uh, cluster, we set them up for being local, um, you know, within, within you know, uh, a region in in um, or a zone in, um, no, I'm sorry, region in AWS, for instance, or, you know, within the same, you know, data warehouse, you know, not necessarily the same rack, but the same data warehouse. So you can create your own REST API in front of Couchbase, but then your app server connects to Couchbase through the binary protocol. Um, and that binary protocol makes things extremely fast um, for storing, for CRUD operations. Um, so, let's see. Yes, there are actually, so someone asked, is there a monitoring management console on Couchbase? Um, there is, and um, I don't have Couchbase running on this computer, so I can't show it to you, but um, uh, we have a great interface, and I think that um, if you install Couchbase, uh, you'll, you know, go through the wizard, you'll be able to actually see it. Um, yep, 
if you store different types of documents, um, is it typically include some? Do you typically include some property used in your views? Yeah, actually, I always use the word doc type. Um, the reason I use doc type is like when I when I pull information from third parties, they actually typically use the word type and I don't want to be confused I don't want to confuse myself so I actually use doc type and um, I actually have sort of a default setting um, that I do where I take the class name um, this this first part here I take the class name and um, down case it um, and that is my doc type Talk type value. It's not stored in the metadata. We want to actually reduce the amount of metadata as much as possible because all the metadata must be um, in RAM at all times in Couchbase. So we want to keep the metadata as small as possible. Um, and metadata is still available in your MapReduce views. And if you're interested in learning about the indexing and querying, you should check out um, you know, our webinar on indexing and querying. Uh, which was done not too long ago, I, and I actually did one on real-time analytics um, with Couchbase, which goes into the structure of MapReduces and, and creating indexes on your JSON data, um, which is a great webinar to sort of get an intro um, to indexing in Couchbase. Um, let's see if there's a lot of questions here. Is storing binary data within Couchbase a good idea? Yes, actually, you can store um, anything you want in Couchbase. We're not limited to JSON at all. You can store integers and strings. We have operations, string operations for append and prepend. Um, we have atomic counters for making sure that you know atomic counters are positive integer values that um, all the operations on them are executed are guaranteed to be executed in order. Uh, which is very useful for things like you know points and games, or um, it's actually a great uh, way to use a, use it for a key value pattern, which you can see on cache based models. Like it's called a counter ID pattern, um, and many people store um, you know binary blobs. You can you can actually you know marshal your objects to binary um, into cache based. That's quite common for like session store where you're not going to index it. The only thing to understand is that if you want to create indexes on, you know, parts of that data, it needs to be in JSON so that you actually have a key and value that you're indexing on. If it's binary, it won't deserialize it within Couchbase to try and find a field uh, within it um, because it may not even be JSON at all. It might, if you, you know, uh, it might be a JPEG or it might be some other type of binary blob. But you can store binary, and our documents have a 20 megabyte uh, limit. Um, let's see here. Uh, what is the backup system on Couchbase? We have a you know backup and restore tool. It's a command line interface called CB Backup and CB Restore, and we also have another command called CB Transfer that uh, you can move data between clusters. Um, Uh, are there capacity planning tools to estimate plan size for? We're actually, um, I think there is a blog post either out or coming out very soon on sizing guidelines. Um, if you just kind of uh, watch our blogs um, or just check out our blogs, I, I have to check to see whether it came out yet or if it's uh, coming soon. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, our docs are actually excellent. Um, there's a lot of great content in our docs as well. So this is actually interesting and quite common question. If I update um, data shared amongst different users, in SQL I, de I normalize that into its own sort of table and so they all have all the things that depend on that content have this foreign key relationship and you do a join on that. In document stores, because it's denormalized, if you want to update, you know, um, 
uh, you know, a number of documents that all have this shared data, you actually have to create a job to update all the documents and do that, or you do it dynamically within your, um, there's basically two approaches. One is to run a job and change all the data, iterate through all the, all the documents where the, the change is required, and then another option is to just do it on the fly dynamically, because you don't have to take Couchbase down to add data or change schema. Um, so if you want to add a few more JSON keys to the data or you want to change them, you don't actually have to take Couchbase down and do a migration like you do in the relational world. In fact, like for um, you know this uh, sort of instance of ours, because of this self to hash in my Ruby, all I need to do if I want to have more instance variables or add things to my JSON document, I can uh, you know I can just add it as a as a, a instance variable and then it'll have a I mean it'll be defaulting to, to null here because I don't actually have any logic but if in my controller or view I actually you know calculate the user rating I can dynamically add um, this to my user JSON document literally just by adding this instance variable and Couchbase is still running I don't have to do a migration so you can also do that within, um, and it's quite common to do that, um, to have like sort of versions of, of, of your classes and versions of your documents so that you know that if, um, you know, a document is version 1 and your object is version 1.1 one, one and you've made changes, that you have a routine to update the document from 1.0 1, 1 to 1.1. 1 .1. You have a routine for that um, where you make the changes and save it back. Um, that's doing it on the fly, or you do a job where you actually execute and run across your data structures and update them all. Is there something like referential integrity in Couchbase? No, that's something that you have to maintain in your application logic. Um, if you create, if, if you, for instance, um, have a shopping cart that has a product uh, SKUs in, in there and you delete the product SKU document, like the actual product document that that refers to, there's no automatic way to go through all the shopping carts and flag it, for instance, or say that product no longer exists. Or um, this is, you know, one of the things that you start learning about when you start using document data stores is how to, you know, sort of the new design patterns, uh, the new ways of working with uh, the documents. And so, why use a document database at all when you're so used to, um, you know, the relational systems and how it works? Is actually the agility that you have and the scale. Um, the speed, scale, and agility. Like I was able to build, you know, this application really quickly um, because I can work with JSON. If, if you, if I can show you, sort of the, uh, you know, JSON that I get back from, uh, you know, from GitHub, it was humongous, and you know. Like I don't I don't know if I have the original JSON. Oh, I do. So I have this GitHub JSON. If if I had to imagine like creating schemas for every single thing that I get back from GitHub, I would spend days and days just dealing with the schema. Um, and if they change the schema, I would run into problems. Um, if they change the structure of their JSON, you know, I would run into problems with my schema. I'd have to do migrations, and things would break really easily. Um, so in my case, I was able to develop this application much faster because I can work directly with JSON. Um, and I think that that agile development is really exciting. Uh, this is a pretty common question. Is the double colon a standard key naming convention? There is no standard. Actually, you are um, completely in control of your keys um, for documents. I use a double colon because it it's sort of uh, Lisp style, Ruby style, um, but I also find it the easiest to read. Um, 
you know, if 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 that's important to be able to read your keys. Um, See, I only have uh, I only have um, a couple more minutes. Um, let me see if I can find a question that's uh, easily uh, answered in two minutes. Um, let's see what we got here. Let's see. Does Catchbase support unique indexes? Um, we do have secondary indexes you can create on the JSON data. So if I want to index all my user documents by email address, I can create a MapReduce um, index um, in Catchbase. And you can learn more about that in sort of the previous webinars about how to create indexes. Um, but I can, you know, actually index different properties in Catchbase. Um, um, along with the key itself is its own index. That's the primary index, and all the uh, the views or MapReduce indexes are secondary indexes. And we also integrate with Elasticsearch um, through our cross data center replication for full text search on documents. Let's see. The last question I have time for is, is there an identity generator for Couchbase? And the answer is no. Uh, Couchbase um, doesn't provide any sort of um, identity creator, but you can easily do that in your own application. On CouchbaseModels.com, uh, there are some key design patterns um, that you can use for generating keys. You can also use UUIDs or GUIDs. Um, there's like Twitter Snowflake, which is a numeric ID um, with like a sort of ID server. So there's many different ways of generating IDs outside of Couchbase. Um, and there are many different sort of schemes for that. So, but Couchbase itself doesn't have it. That's in control of um, the application developer. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining. Um, I'm looking forward to doing um, another webinar soon and maybe cover even more details of the repo wall application, how I distribute uh, the load, um, you know, and all the requests um, in repo wall across the cloud um, using PubNub, Iron.io, Ruby on Rails, and Couchbase. And then I will be adding sort of um, some polyglot storage to repo wall. I'm going to add um, uh, Neo4j graph database to it as well, so I'll be using Couchbase and Neo4j together and using Neo4j um, for sort of discovery um, and graph type queries, which is really fun to do and exciting as well. And I, I, I'm very, very fond of the, uh, of the Couchbase and Neo4j combination. I think it's, you know, an excellent combination of more general purpose data storage and session storage. Um, in Couchbase and then taking specific properties uh, and putting them in Neo4j for graph type query. Um, well, thank you again for joining. I, I hope you got a lot out of it. Feel free to ping me anytime on Twitter or email, and I'd love to answer more questions. Um, if I wasn't able to get to your question due to time, feel free to ping me on either of those methods. Um, and I'll be more than happy to spend a little bit more time helping you understand uh, Catchbase and app development. Thanks again.